All right. Hi, guys. Hope all of you are well. <clears throat> so today we are starting with this winter 22 paper, 41 paper. Walaikum as -salam. Also, just before we go ahead, I wanted to get some sort of informal feedback from you guys and also like want I also want to know about how you guys want to take this forward. Because the thing is that the past papers that we're doing now, the strength 22 and the ones before that, they're already there on the platform, right? Most of you guys know this. So do you feel like we should keep doing these papers? Like uh, the 2022 paper, should we keep doing them live? Or would the recorded videos also work just as well? The reason I want to know this is because obviously time is limited and I want to see whether we should also give some time to P5, right? That's what I want to do here. So it's up to you guys. I want to hear from you and what you would like to do. Do you want to like uh, reschedule some of the remaining P4 sessions to P5s or what do you want to do here? Just more this. I was doing the same thing with AS as well. They gave me like pretty good feedback on how they would want to take this forward. P5? Okay. So by the way, let me also see when's your P4 and P5. I think they both are like within days of each other. Right? Just let me... What date is P4? What date is P5? Hmm? Guys, what date is P4? What date is P5? P4 is uh, 13th and P5 is 16th May, right? So it's just a couple of days in between. So let's just do today's paper. And then for the rest of the ones, I think it's better that we go on to P5, right? Is that like the unanimous feedback here? Everybody thinks we should do P5s? Yes. Also, if you guys have like any suggestions about some videos that you guys want me to do, I could probably also do like an offline version of that and upload it later. So for example, I was talking to a student and he wanted me to do something, for example, like on graphs of electric potential, graphs of uh, gravitational field strength, you know, things like this. So if you also have like suggestions about stuff you would like to see, you can let me know here in the chat. And then inshallah, when I sit down to do those videos, I would keep those in mind, right? So anything about like, what type of videos do you want to see? Like the usage of some and some equation, so anything of that sort, all right? Anything, just I want something very, very precise so that I can, I can just sit down and then I just start doing the working for that. I just some, want something very preci precise. So not just like, for example, thermodynamics, just tell me like, are, is it the graph questions related to thermodynamics or like with nuclear physics, is it mass effect questions, you know? So things like that. Magnetic field topicals are on the platform, right? So again, you probably know this. So what's the, what do you not find there, which you need help with? So that sort of a thing. I just want something very, very precise, right? So for example, if you say that in magnetic field, I want the, I want help 
with answers related to some questions which are like four or five marks where you have to like give some open-ended responses, right? Right, so the same thing, like in medical physics, point me to something in particular, of example, internal energy in a given situation for thermodynamics. Right, so what's the situation? MRI is not in the syllabus anymore, Shabir. Why are you wasting time with that? MRI is not in the syllabus. Right, so we can talk about this after the session as well. You guys can also keep thinking on it on the side and then we can return to this later. All right, let's get started with this. So winter 22, paper 41. Let's get started with this one. Again, I'll try to do this a bit uh, faster because we have this solved already on the platform. So state the equation for the gravitational force between two point masses M1 and M2 separated by a distance R. State the meaning of any other symbols you use. So we know this is Newton's law of gravitation. G, M1, M2. Separation is R squared. So you just need to say additionally here that G is the gravitational constant. Right? Very straightforward. Next part, part B. A satellite is in a circular orbit of radius r around a pla planet of mass m. Whenever you see this word orbit, in any question related to gravitation, you know that you need to now think about what force is there which is providing the gravitational force. What force is providing the force for the orbit, the centripetal force? So we know that for orbits, the gravitational force provides the centripetal force. Now, there are quite a few ways to go about this. Some people like to use instead of uh, Fc, some people like to use mv square over r, some use mr omega square. And we've, saw, and we've seen this time and again that it always leads to the same answer. Gravitational force, what we just wrote above, g m1 m2 over r square, right? So... All right, so here, this is around a planet of mass M. So actually, let me rework this and make it so that I write this in terms of uppercase M and lowercase M. So it's capital M. And let's say the mass of this satellite, which is in the field of this uh, field, capital M, that's small M. And again, that is orbiting the larger mass. So that is the mass of the satellite, r omega squared. So from here, you see m's cancel out. So you have gm over r cube. Also, let's use the symbols the examiner is using. gm over r cube omega squared. You also know that omega is 2 pi over t. So mega square becomes four pi square over T square equals G M over R cube. Then I just rearrange this equation to get the form which is shown here. So T square equals G M over four pi squared R cube. So you can see all of this thing is just a constant. And that's how you reach this, right? T square equals KR cube just shows that T square is directly proportional to R cube. Part C, a satellite is in a circular orbit around the Earth with a period of 24 hours. Mass of Earth is given. Calculate the radius of the orbit. So now we need to find R. So let's rearrange this equation in this form. R cube is 4 pi square T square over g m so 4 pi square t is 24 hours uh, si unit is seconds so 24 and each hour has 3600 seconds right each hour has 60 minutes each minute has 60 seconds divided by g m 6.67 into 10 to the negative 11 is g 
m is 6.0 into 10 to the 24. Keep in mind that this is r cubed. So then whatever you get from here, you take the cube root of that to get r, right? So r turns out to be 4.2 into 10 to the 7 meters, right? So also uh, start thinking about this as you're doing the breaking. So the satellite is in a circular orbit around the Earth with a period of 24 hours. So the same period as Earth, right? So it could be a geostationary orbit. We don't know now for sure, because you would also need to know its direction of rotation. Is it rotating in the same direction as the Earth? And I should also think about whether it's in the equatorial plane or not. But it could be a geostationary orbit. Again, honestly, I didn't know what the question is going to be. State the other two conditions that must be met for the orbit to be geostationary. So one must be that the rotation is in the same direction as the rotation of Earth. So rotation is west to east. And another condition is that the orbit must be in the equatorial plane. Does this question make sense? Oh, all right. I got you now, Alicia. Okay. So like the ones we did uh, where we had like a gas explodes or a puddle of water evaporates, that sort of thing. Okay. Got you. Yeah, sorry about that. So yes, all right. Electromagnetic waves numerical. So that's part of AS, right? Again, if you write this on the platform, I'm sure that somebody's there making a list. They can then forward to me. Oh, right, let's just think about this long and hard. Okay, let's go on. So this was really easy, I guess. Question number one. The more of these you do, the better you get at them. 2.1 shows a lab thermometer that is calibrated to measure temperature in degrees, in degrees Celsius. So you have the bulb, uh, and this is a mercury in glass thermometer, glass tube, capillary. The thermometer makes use of the fact that the density of mercury varies with temperature. So you know this, that if we ever want to vary, if we ever want to measure temperature, we need to have a property that varies with temperature. So state two other physical properties of metals apart from the density of a liquid that can be used for measuring temperature, right? So what are other thermometric properties that we could use to measure temperature, right? So we know that, for example, if you're talking about a thermocouple, so we know that it's the EMF of a thermocouple. And similarly, I also know another one is the volume of gas constant pressure. Right, there are some of these that you do need to know. If you guys remember the video lectures that I did for this chapter, so we discussed four of these. One of them is shown here in the question. Another one is the EMF of a thermocouple. There's volume of a gas at constant pressure, and there's also the resistance of a metal, how that changes with temperature, right? Also in the recent times, you did a question where there was a property which was going up and then going down. And then you also talked about how that's unsuitable for measuring temperature, because the changes must always be monotonous. If it's increasing, it should increase throughout. If it's decreasing, it needs to decrease throughout. It doesn't even have to be linear. It just needs to be changing always the same way. 
If it's increasing, it needs to increase. If it's decreasing, it needs to decrease, right? There should never be a, there should never be a case where a certain value of that thermometric property corresponds to two temperatures, right? It should never happen. That thing can then not be used to measure temperature, right? So if, for example, I'm talking on this, so let's just draw a diagram. So if this is some property, this is the thermometric property that I want to uh, use to measure temperature. And here, if I have temperature, so if I have a graph which goes like this, now you can see that there is corresponding to that one property, there could potentially be two temperatures, right? There could be two temperatures. This is not right. You can't use this for the measurement of temperature then. So just keep this in mind. The thermometer is initially at 23 degrees Celsius as is shown. It is used to measure the temperature of an insulated beaker of water that is at 37.4. The bulb of the thermometer is inserted into the water and the water is stirred until the reading on the thermometer becomes steady. Mass of the water in the beaker, mass of mercury in the thermometer, specific heat capacity of water, specific heat capacity of mercury, and the glass of the thermometer in the beaker containing the water can be considered to have negligible heat capacity. Calculate to 3SF the final steady temperature indicated by the thermometer in the water. Right now, what's going to happen here? Now, if you guys remember, this is a question that's also been done by me in the end of chapter questions. So this is part of that. This is a question where you really need to think this through. Now, one of the things that you need to realize is why the thermometer will show you some temperature is because it's absorbing heat energy, right? And that heat energy will basically be lost by this water. All right. So here I need to, first of all, identify that heat gained, the thermal energy gained by the thermometer. is equal to the thermal energy lost by the water. All right. So heat gained by thermometer, obviously I know there's no changes of state involved. Both of these things are just uh, either increasing in temperature or decreasing in temperature. So I just use E equals to MC delta T or what you guys might also know as Q equals MC delta theta. So heat gained by the thermometer. Now again, if you think about the final steady temperature, so you should also think about this idea that thermal energy transfer stops when the temperature difference between both of them is zero. So the final steady temperature is going to be the same temperature of the water and also of the beacon. Let's say that final steady temperature that I want to find this is T. So for the heat gained by the thermometer, I know that this is going to be mass of the thermometer, so mass of the mercury, so that's 6.94 grams. Whenever using this equation, we always do need to make sure that the units of mass and specific heat capacity are consistent with one another. So mercury is 6.94, this is 0.14. So you just multiply these together, right? If one was grams, another one was kg, then you would need to convert. So 6.94, 0 0.140. And now for the temperature difference part. Now, some people do like really complex sort of calculations when talking about heat lost. And I'll show you how this works in just a second. Now I know that the thermal, the thermometer is going to gain temperature, right? Its initial temperature was 23. And now it's gone up to a certain temperature T. So I know that the change in temperature would be T minus 23, right? This is not because this is final minus initial. Rather, I know that to make this term positive, the T, the final temperature is larger than the initial temperature. That's why I did T minus 23. 
Now you just apply the same thing into the heat lost by the water. So mass of the water in the beaker is 18.7. Its specific heat capacity is 0.14, right? Now, for the final steady temperature, we know that if heat has been gained by the thermometer, there must have been heat lost by the water. Now for it to lose heat, the final temperature would, would be smaller than what it was initially, right? It's now going to be smaller than what it was. So this time around, even though I know that the final temperature is T, I'm not going to do T minus 37.4 because that would make the, this thing here then negative. So what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to keep both of these terms, the heat gained and the heat lost, I want both of these to be positive. So if I would do T minus 37.4, I know I would get a negative value. So I just switch that around and I say 37.4 minus T, right? You need to be really, really alert when doing calculations of these sorts. Because if you uh, mess up with this, then your answer is also going to be turning out to be different, right? And also in this one, you would probably get the correct answer maybe based on how the math works out. But if there's another term here, maybe being added or subtracted, then it won't be the same at all, right? Now we just do the algebra for it. So 6.94 times 0.14 is 0 0.9716, so 0.9716, and I multiply this value by this bracket then. So 0 0.9716 T minus, this times 23, so minus 23.4, equals 18.7 times 0 0.140, times 37.4 is, 27.9132 minus 2.618 T. So now this is just algebra. I take both of these to one side. So I have 0 0.9716 plus 2.618, which is 3.5896 T equals to this value plus this value when it goes there. So 97.9132 plus 22.3468 is 120.26. So 120.26 divided by 3.5896 is 33.5. Right, so 33.5 degrees Celsius. All right. Oh, sorry, I just realized I made a mistake which is that this value must not be 0.14, it should be this, right? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for the catch. This is 4.18, right? Yes, thank you. 18.7 times 4.18. So this is... So this is minus 78.1660 times 37.4 is 2923, right? Okay, so here, uh, yeah, then we just rearrange this equation. We take this to the other side. So this becomes so 78.166. Plus 0 0.9716, which is which is 79.13760, and the other one 2923, 2923 plus 22.3468, this is. 2945 divided by 79.1376. Now we get the correct answer, which is 37.2. So it's 
So now at this point, and this is again, what gets you a good grade in AS as well as A2 physics, if you really start to think about what the working you did really means. Now, ideally, if something is sensing temperature, it should just be sensing it. It should just give you what the actual temperature is. So even though this actual temperature was 37.4 degrees Celsius, is it caused the temperature to slightly drop. And the one it shows in the thermometer in the water is 37.2, right? Maybe we would have something with this to do in the next part. So just one change that could be made to the design of the thermometer that would enable it to give a more accurate measurement of temperature. So about this, how should you think about this change? So you would want the heat gained by the thermometer and the heat lost by the water to be as small as possible, right? So if you want it to gain less heat so that less heat is now also lost by the water, you could use something which has a low specific heat capacity, right? So if you use something which has a low specific heat capacity, then it won't, what do you call it? Then it won't extract as much heat from that water. So if you have a lower specific heat capacity, liquid than mercury, Or another change is also here, if you look at this equation, now obviously you can't do anything to this thing, right? You can't do anything to the heat loss by the water. This is obvious. But also you can basically work around with these two things. So the mass and the specific heat capacity, right? Now, if you want this to be as small as possible, you want this thing. So you want your C to be as small as possible or you could want the M, the mass to be as small as possible. So if, if you also say, I want to use a smaller mass of mercury, that would also be correct. Explain why the thermometer in 2.1 does not provide a direct measurement of the thermodynamic temperature. Right, so what's the idea about thermodynamic temperature is that thermodynamic temperature is independent of physical properties, right? So thermodynamic temperature does not depend on physical properties. Rather, if you know how it's defined, so it's, uh, what do you call it? It's based on the absolute zero value, right? So, It is based on absolute zero. And if you know how a thermometer is designed, so thermometer, if you look here, so this uh, is basically based on the ice point and the uh, boiling point, and that's how you design a thermometer. That's how you calibrate it. So this is not absolute zero, which is not zero degrees Celsius. Thermodynamic temperature may be determined by the behavior of a type of substance for which T is proportional to the product of pressure and volume. So what's this thing? Obvious. This is an ideal gas. All right. An object is suspended from a string that is attached to a fixed point as shown in 3.1. The object oscillates vertically with simple harmonic motion about its equilibrium position. State the defining equation. Identify the meaning of each of the symbols used to present, represent these physical quantities. So A equals to negative omega square X. A, you know, shows the acceleration. 
Omega, you know, is the angular frequency. X is the displacement. And you know that the negative sign shows the, uh, basically A and X being in opposite directions. So I see we have questions. Yes, right? You don't really need to comment on the negative sign here, but I'm just still telling you this. All right, so we have the variation with displacement X from the equilibrium position of the velocity with displacement, right? Whenever you see a graph, you, you should always have an equation that you can link it to. So if you remember your SHM formulas, and there is a video on the platform which just talks about what are the different equations in SHM? I've summarized all of them in, in a small video. So this one is this, right? This is really what is plotted here. Plus minus omega x naught square minus x square. So the variation with potential energy of the oscillations is shown. Using 3.2 and 3.3 .3 determine the amplitude x naught. So amplitude must be like how far it goes. So it's 0.12 in both directions. So the amplitude is 0.12. This is really easy. Next show that the angular frequency is this much. So the angular frequency we can get if we know this equation. And if you're thinking about this right here. Now here I can obviously see a lot of points, but I know that in this one, if this is my max velocity, so max velocity, if I look here, max velocity, you know this by the way, max velocity happens when your displacement is zero, right? So you have omega and this root of x naught squared. So you just have omega x naught. So max velocity V max, which is 0.2 is omega x naught. So V max, is omega x naught, just point two equals omega, and x naught is point one two. So you just rearrange, and you should be getting this. Similarly, maximum acceleration is omega x naught squared, right? You know that the displacement, the velocity, the acceleration, all of these are varying with time in simple harmonic motion. So we're talking about the max values right now. Determine the mass M of the object. So this you get from the potential energy graph, right? So you can see that at the amplitude, you have max potential energy, which is this much. So if you have max potential energy as 0 0.05, you know that potential energy is given by half M omega square X square, right? And in this case, it's also X naught squared because this is the amplitude at which we're talking about. So half M omega is going to be this thing, 0 0.2 or 0.12. So it's 1.67 squared, X squared is 0 0.12 squared. So from this, we just do the math here, 0 0.05 times two over 1.67 squared times, 1 point, times 0 0.12 squared, so this is 2.49 or 2.5 as the mass predicted to a second. Next state, what is meant by damping? So the loss in energy, or you can instead of energy also say the amplitude of a system because of resistive forces, which take away that energy. Assume that the damping does not change the angular frequency of the oscillations. 
sketch the variation with x of v when the amplitude of oscillations is 0 0.06 meters. So if you're talking about the amplitude being 0 0.06 meters, we now need to sketch a new graph here. So I know that this is going to be my amplitude, 0 0.06. This is what it's going to be now, right? And for this amplitude, if I know that omega is the same, I can also calculate the max velocities, right? Omega x naught. Now, if you see here, basically the velocity, basically the amplitude halved. And because of omega being constant, V max will also half, right? So from 0.2, it will now become 0.1 and hence negative 0.1. If you don't believe me, the omega calculations with the new x naught will also give you the same values. So now you just need to make an ellipse again, which goes through all of these points. All right, so this is what we're expecting here. For A state, what is indicated by the direction of an electric field line? So we know that it shows the direction of force, but the way this is defined is on a positive charge. Four point one shows a pair of parallel metal plates with a potential difference of 2400 volts between them. Plates are separated by a distance of this much. The plates are in a vacuum. Draw five lines to represent the electric field in the region between the plates. So the drawing of the electric field lines is in a way that it, it always goes from the higher potential to a lower potential. So you just draw five field lines. But additionally, because th this is a case where we have field lines between plates, so they should also be equally spaced, right? So this is also something you should be able to show here. So equal spacing. All right, so this is what we need to show here. Calculate the strength of the electric field between the plates. So electric field strength, you know, these two equations, force per unit charge, potential difference divided by distance. This one only holds for the parallel metal plates case. In a way, if you remember these videos, this is just a specialized application of this formula right here, which you know applies to all situations, even to point charges, right? That the electric field strength is the negative of the potential gradient. So that's uh, the application to the case of parallel metal plates. We knew the potential difference was 2400, and this is separated through a distance And this is separated through a distance of 4.6 centimeters, 2400 over 4.6 centimeters, so 4.6 into 10 to the negative two. So the answer for E we must be getting here is 5.2 into 10 to the four, to two SF. All right, I see we have questions. How do we decide? I didn't really decide it. It's that it's always going to be from positive to negative, right? Because an electric field line is always from positive to negative. And you know that because it's drawn with respect to how a positive charge would feel that force. So you know it would be repelled by the higher potential, by the positive plate. 
and it would be attracted to the opposite plate, right? So that's the reasoning from this, all right? A moving proton enters the region between the plates from the left as shown in 4.2. The proton is deflected by the electric field. Draw a line to show the path of the proton as it moves through and out of the region of the electric field. So it should go out here as well. So you know that uh, what we just made exactly in uh, what exactly in accordance with the question which was just asked by a student. So you know that this is going to be deflected in the direction of the electric field because this is a proton which is positively charged. So it's going to be deflected downwards. So it's going to enter and then it's going to go like this but the electric field on it was only acting as long as it was in the field. After this, this is going to go off at a tangent again. So like this. It just goes off at a tangent because there is no more force acting on it. A helium nucleus now enters the region of the electric field along the same initial path as the proton and traveling at the same initial speed. State and explain how the final speed of the helium nucleus compares with the final speed of the proton after leaving the region of the electric field. All right, so we have a question first. All right, good job guys, yes. So the, so what you have to think about with the helium nucleus is that it's also positively charged, right? But there is some change with its composition, which is going to cause a difference in this final speed. So we know that the force for this constant electric field strength, because F equals EQ, I can say F is proportional to Q. So the greater the charge, the greater would be the force it feels as well, right? So first thing I will say is that since the helium nucleus has twice the charge. It experiences twice the force. But then if I think about the other, th other thing here, I basically thought about the proton number here. If I think about the nucleon number, so I know that it has four times the mass of a proton, right? Now, how is mass even going to apply here? Is because if it has four times the mass, so I know of this equation as well, F equals MA, right? So the force which acts on them, the force, this is double, but the mass, of the helium nucleus is four times the mass of the proton, right? So now if I think about the acceleration, because this doubled and this quadrupled basically, the acceleration will half, right? So the acceleration halves. So since mass of the helium nucleus is four times the mass of a proton. Let's just skip this redundant stuff. So since this is four times, the acceleration is halved. And I have to now compare the final speeds, right? So for the final speeds as they leave, I can see that this is basically going to be a case of projectile motion, if you understand this, because the force always acts in a certain direction. And that force has no impact on the horizontal velocity, just has an impact on the vertical velocity. here. So here I can't make any definitive assumptions about what the final speed is going to be, right? Because the initial speed, let's say this is just this thing here. Right, so this is just V like this. But then I know that because of the action of the electric field, 
This speed will also be V when it exits the field, but because of the downwards acceleration, it's now also going to have a component like this. So if this is like Vx, the horizontal velocity, it's also now going to be Vy, right? So for Vy, I know this is going to be calculated by virtue of the acceleration, which I don't really have at hand. So I'm not just going to say that if it's going to be like doubled or tripled or anything like that, I'll just say that the velocity of the helium nucleus is going to be smaller, right? Because acceleration is smaller. All right. So I just need to compare them. Is it more or is it less? So the answer is if for the helium nucleus, it's less. A capacitor of capacitance 470 microfarad is connected to a battery of EMF 24 volts in the circuit of 5.1. The two-way switch is initially at position X P and Q are identical long straight wires, each with a resistance of this much. These wires are placed near to and parallel to each other. Wire Q is connected to a voltmeter. Right? So this is connected to a voltmeter. At time t equals to zero, the switch S is moved to position Y so that the capacitor discharges through this wire P. Right? So this is now a resistor that the capacitor is going to discharge through. So A part one, calculate the charge Q naught on the capacitor at time T equals to zero. Now this is very easy because before the switching, all of the voltage of the supply here must have appeared across here, right? So if we think about this, we just have to use this equation Q equals to CV. So C, C is 470 micro. This is 24. So we just multiply these to find the initial charge. 470 micro to 24, which is 0 0.01128, 0 0.01113 coulombs. All right, next part, calculate the current I naught in wire P at time T equals to zero. So how do I now find the current? In wire P, right? So in wire P at time t equals to zero, what is the current going to be? So I know that this is the charge here, which is 0 0.011. And when this is now going to be connected in this position, all of the 24 volts across here is now also going to appear here, right? So you have a voltage of 24 volts, which appears across a resistance of this much. So I equals to V over R, so 24 over 5.6 kilo, so 5,600 ohms. So this turns out to be 4.3 into 10 to the negative, three amperes. Calculate the time constant tau of the discharge circuit. So we know tau equals RC, right? So R was 5.6 and C was 470 micro. So 5.6 kilo, 470 micro. So you just multiply both of these together, right? So the answer turns out to be 2.6 seconds. Sketch a line to show the variation with I of the with T of the current I in the wire P as the capacitor discharges. So as it discharges, we know that the current is going to keep getting less exponentially like this, right? This is how all basically graph shapes are going to be unless linearized in capacitance. Why is the current decreasing like this? Is because as we are talking about this, because it's depositing some of its charge onto the resistor, it's uh, basically making the current flow through it. So the voltage across this will keep falling. Right? So this is why the current decreases like that because the charge and hence the voltage is falling. Explain why there is an induced EMF across wire Q 
during the discharge of the capacitor. All right, so across YQ, why do we have an induced EMF? So I know that the current is going to fall here. And I also know the idea that a current flowing in a conductor gives rise to a magnetic field. So because the current is changing, right? I know it's decreasing, but for what I'm about to say, the word changing will suffice. So since the current changes, the magnetic field will also change, causing a rate of change of magnetic flux in the secondary coil, which is going to induce an EMF, right? That's all I have to say. So current in P changes leading to a changing magnetic field. So there is a rate of change of magnetic flux. At this time, I'm not using the word linkage, which is obviously on purpose because linkage we use with some turns of wire. There is a rate of change of magnetic flux. Causing an induced EMF. In the wire. Q, right? The rate of change of magnetic flux, or again, you can also say that magnetic flux is cut by Q. So causing a cutting effect in Q, and that's what causes the EMF. See, we have questions. I just said that we use the word linkage because if you look at the formulas, so phi, this is what we call flux. This is BA, right? Magnetic flux linkage is N phi, which is NBA, which is what we use when we have some number of turns of wire. So for example, if I had a coil, a solenoid, I would use the term magnetic flux linkage. If it's just a wire, which has no turns, I'll use magnetic flux. All right, that's the reason. Sketch a line to suggest the variation with T of the voltmeter reading. Now, we know that the current was changing, right? So the current was changing and the current is basically going to give rise to a magnetic field. You might also know this and it just helps to know that for a straight wire, the greater the current, the greater is the magnetic field strength, which is also produced. So I know that this I, I know that this B, which is going to be produced, how this is changing with respect to time is going to give me this EMF here, right? So how this EMF is going to change with time is going to give me uh, this, what do you call it? This is going to give me the EMF. So what I can just do is that I can think of this as taking gradients of this time. So initially I have a really high gradient because the current is changing the fastest, hence the magnetic field strength is changing the fastest, and then it keeps going down, right? So then it's decreasing like this. So the induced EMF would also decrease. Now, if anybody is taking math, then I would expect them to also recognize that because this is e to the negative x, in, in finding the magnitude, in finding the EMF, I'm really just taking the gradient of this. So this would also be a negatively shaped uh, shape. So you can make anything as long as it goes down. You can make this, but obviously the examiner also knows that everybody who takes A-level physics may not take math. So if you also just make a straight line which goes down, this is also fine, right? Both of these work. The idea is that you should see that since the rate at which the current is decreasing is also decreasing, so the EMF will also decrease. So that's the idea here. Does this make sense?
Okay, let's go on. 6.1 shows a thin slice of semiconducting material used in a hall probe. Current I passes through the slice in the direction shown. A slice is placed in a uniform magnetic field of flux density B so that two of its faces are perpendicular to the magnetic field. A steady hall voltage is developed between phases P, X, P, Q, X, W, and S, R, Y, Z. Use the letters in 6.1 to identify faces that are perpendicular to the magnetic field. Right? So this is how the current goes. And we know that the magnetic field acts in a way that basically deposits the electrons either here or here. So use the letters in 6.1 to identify two faces that are perpendicular to the magnetic field. So we know that the way the magnetic field acts is through the top like this, right? It acts in this direction, which causes the field, which causes the charge carriers, the electrons to be deposited onto these plates, right? This is stuff you should know, but if you don't know, you can, you can figure this out using Fleming's left-hand rule. If I want my conductors to maybe be deposited here or here, so with the current going like this, with the current going like this, you can see that my first finger is pointing upwards. So it should be in this direction. So it's perpendicular to both of these faces, PQRS and WZYX. PQRS, WXYZ. PQRS, WXYZ. All right. So that's the answer to this one. No, the graph doesn't have to be a curve. It could also be a straight line. Explain how the steady hall voltage is developed between phases P, X, Q, W, and S, R, Y, Z. So you know that because of Fleming's left-hand rule, there's going to be a force on charge carriers. So force on charge carriers, which is mutually perpendicular. to both current and field. So then you also know that as the charge carriers are deposited, onto a side, As the charge carriers are deposited, there's also an electric field which is set up. And you know that no more charges can be deposited when the charge carriers, which are already there, when they produce a strong enough electrostatic force, which prevents the deposit of more charge carriers onto that face, right? So this voltage become steady when the electric and magnetic forces are balanced, right? So the magnetic force basically causes it to be uh, deflected to a certain side, the electric force causes it to be deflected to the other side. So when both of these are balanced, the charge carriage just goes straight through the electric and magnetic forces are balanced. Right? You say forces are balanced or fields are balanced. It means the same thing. Magnitude of VH is given by this equation, VI over NTQ. The derivation of the Hall voltage is very much in your syllabus. So you should know how this uh, equation comes about. State the meanings of the symbols N, T, and Q. So N is the number density of the material. T is the thickness. Also, if I have to ask you to suggest in this question, what is the thickness that which this current goes through? 
So it's going to be the thickness which is perpendicular to the current, right? So you can say PW or SZ, which by the symmetry of this certain cross section is also going to be QX or RY, right? So always remember this, that the thickness is perpendicular to the current. So this is PW or any of those corresponding lengths. Q is the charge of a charge carrier. Again, if you've seen my lectures on the hall voltage, I have talked about this idea very in a lot of detail. This is also, by the way, on the topic of P5s, this is also something which is asked in P5. You need to start thinking about it along these lines. That, for example, if you want your hall voltage to be more, right? This is something that you do want with different things. In P5s, you might see, for example, if you're dropping something from a certain height and you measure the time, for example, uh, that it takes to fall through a certain height, you would also say as a potential improvement, you would say that this height needs to be as large as possible. So that the time is also as large as possible. And if you're timing this with a stopwatch, it would reduce the percentage uncertainty introduced by the human reaction time. There's something very similar happening here. Because you want your hall voltage to be as large as possible, remember that the current should be as large as possible. And for this fraction to be as large as possible, N, T, and Q should be as small as possible. So we use a semiconductor material because we want uh, N to be as small as possible. And we use a thin slice because we want T to be as small as possible. So a small thickness will lead to a large and measurable VH. Large and measurable, measurable VH. Right? This is basically because of since they are inversely proportional. All right, you guys do remember that I did this in a lot of detail in the lectures here. Sinusoidal alternating voltages, RMS, this much, frequency this much, alternating voltages applied across a resistance 760 ohms. By considering the peak voltage show that the max power dissipated is this much. So if the RMS is this much, I know dividing by root two, this would give me my peak voltage, right? So 4.2 over root two. No, just a sec. Yeah, RMS is 4.2. So this is going to be 4.2 root two. Right, 4.2 root 2 is going to be my peak. So 5.93994. I'm just writing this down. I'll be using my calculator value. So max power is going to be the max voltage squared over R. So I'm just using P equals V squared over R. So the square of this divided by R, which is 760 squared divided by 760 is 0 0.0464 watts, which is the same thing as this guy here, right? Draw a smooth curve to show how the power dissipated in the resistor varies with time between t equals to zero and t equals to 40 microseconds. Assume that P is zero when T is zero, right? So now we know it's going to be a sine shape, not a cos shape because voltage is zero at time T equals to zero. That's why the power is also zero. So whenever we hit the max voltages is also when the power would be max. We were given the frequency above. So let's use that to first find out the time period. 
So one over 50 kilo, right? So one over 50 kilo. So this is two into 10 to the negative five, or I can see this is 20 microseconds, right? 20 microseconds is the time period. So after 20 microseconds, the voltage would become zero again. So if I now split this down in quarters, I know the voltage would be max here, then zero here, then min here, right? Which would also lead to the max power and then again, zero. So I have points like these. So the max power is 46 milliwatts, right? So let's locate the 46 milliwatts. Mm, so 27.5, 30, 32.5, 35, 37.5, 40, 42.5, I messed this up, 37.5, 40, 42.5, 45, this would be 47.5, so somewhere in the middle is what I'm going for. Right, and then I know the voltage would be max, then zero then max, right? The voltage would be min, but because again, we are squaring it. So a negative max also gives us a max power. And then, yes, so like this, 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 and this. I will just join all of these together. So that's what we get. Isn't VRMS? No, VRMS is what is given in this question. 4.2 is the VRMS. All right, 4.2 is the VRMS. All right, Yusuf. From the RMS, we calculate the peak. VRMS is V peak over root two. So that's me just rearranging this formula. Use your line in A2 to explain why the mean power dissipated in the resistor is 23 milliwatts. So use a line in A2, right? So this curve that we just made, how is the mean power uh, 23 milliwatts? So you can see that it's basically symmetrical about this because this is 46 milliwatts. So this is symmetrical about 23. So line is symmetrical about 23 milliwatts. Alternating voltage in A is now applied to a piezoelectric crystal in air. Explain what happens to the air surrounding the crystal. So you know that the alternating PD makes the crystal vibrate, which causes it to emit the ultrasound waves. producing ultrasound waves. Makes the crystal vibrate, which makes the surrounding air vibrate. Right, so it produces like compressions and rarefactions. The air vibrate, producing Also, it does say happens to the air, right? So the air vibrates and vibrate producing ultrasound waves, which you know are waves with frequency greater than 20 kilohertz. A second piezoelectric crystal is placed in the air near to the first crystal. Explain the effect of the surrounding air in B1 on the second crystal. So because of that, there's going to be an ultrasound wave, which is now going to be incident on the second piezoelectric crystal. So this will now produce an EMF, right? So you have to explain this. So air makes the crystal vibrate, producing an alternating EMF.
okay that's how piezoelectric crystals work right if you apply a pressure to them if you apply a voltage if you apply a pressure to them say if you like uh have some waves incident on it it's going to give you an emf and then in reverse if you apply an emf to them it gives you ultrasound waves right No, it, it works both ways. You apply a voltage, you get uh, vibrations, right? Which gives you those ultrasound waves and also in reverse, the ultrasound waves when incident on another piezoelectric crystal, that gives you the EMF. Say so what is meant by the work function energy of a metal. So we know this is the minimum energy of photons, right? Of the photons which are incident on a metal, which causes emission. Right, so this is the minimum energy that the photons need to have. So ultraviolet radiation of frequency this much is incident on in a vacuum on a metal surface. Power of radiation is this much. Photoelectrons emitted with a max kinetic energy of this much. Determine the number of photons incident on the surface per unit time. So the power which is incident here, which is 8.36 milliwatts, I can say this is the uh, product of the number of photons times the times the power of each one photon. Right, so n is the number of photons. Let's actually use this here. So eight point three six milliwatts. Right, and then the power of each photon. So this is surface per unit time. Right. So let's say we're talking about just one second here. So the power really then just becomes the energy. Right. It's per unit time, power over time, power over time. So this is energy. Both of these are energies. All right. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, because this is per unit time. So power times time, power times time. So both of these are energies. Yes. So the energy of the total radiation is this much equals N times the energy of one photon, which is HF. So 6.63 into 10 to the negative 34 times the frequency. 1.36 into 10 to the 15. So you just reorganize this, take this here and divide. So the number per unit time is 9.27 into 10 to the 15 photons. These are the number of photons arriving in one second. The relation with intensity we'll just look at in a while. Calculate the work function energy. So what do we know? We know Ek max. If I think about Einstein's equation. So I know, actually I, I like to write it like this. Hf, the energy of the photon equals the work function energy plus Ek max. Right, so phi is Hf minus Ek max. So HF, again, whatever value we had there, times the frequency, minus the max kinetic energy, so 3.09 times 10 to the negative 19, right? So whatever this turns out to be is our answer. 5.93 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now, these parts which are asked a lot, frequency of radiation incident on the surface in B is increased while the power remains constant. So power remains constant. This really means intensity remains constant. 
right? Because intensity is power over area. State and explain the effect of this change on the max Ke of the photoelectrons. So the electrons which are emitted because of the photons are known as photoelectrons. So max Ke, so if I look at this equation, if the frequency is increased, so each photon now comes in with more energy. So it also passes on more of that energy to the electrons. So Ek max increases, right? So I'll say photons now have greater energy. causing electrons to also have greater kinetic energy. The rate of emission of photoelectrons, right? So this is something we have talked about. If we talk about frequency here, by the way, this is also very obvious in the calculation that we just did. So the number of photons was what? It was the power of radiation divided by the power of one photon, right? So the total power divided by the power of one photon. So you can see here that if the power of one photon increases now, the energy of one photon, so the number of photoelectrons arriving, the number of photons arriving would now decrease if the power is the same, right? So now the number of photons arriving decreases for the same power. So the number of photons arriving decreases, right? So, since there are now less photons which are arriving, so obviously each photon gives rise to each electron, right? So since each photon interacts with each, with one electron, rate of emission also goes down. All right. State what is meant by the luminosity of a star. So the luminosity of the star is the total power of radiation. EM radiation. Right, that's luminosity. All right, so I see we have a question. Rate of emission depends on intensity and intensity is constant. How is this changing? Because if we look here, I can say exactly as how, how I said it in an earlier part, I can say that the energy of the radiation which comes in, the energy of the radiation is the number of photons which are coming in times the energy of one such photon, right? Now here, if intensity remains the same, this means that energy also remains the same. So now if I am increasing the frequency, this means I'm increasing the energy of each photon. But for the total energy, the total intensity to be the same, the number of photons will now go down. All right. If you don't remember this idea, just go to one of those videos where I've discussed the ideas we have discussed how like all of these different properties provide the evidence of the particular nature of EM radiation. So that's the idea. Right, so this thing. So luminosity is the total power of uh, EM radiation. Next part. So a star in this constellation is a distance of this much from Earth, has a luminosity of this much. Surface temperature is given. Calculate the radiant flux intensity from the star observed from the Earth. Give a unit. Again, these questions are also, by the way, what I've done. I did this last year. Because uh, 
astronomy and cosmology was released much earlier than the rest of the syllabus, which I guess just got done, got done around Feb. So this is still there on the platform. You will have all 2022 questions, astronomy and cosmology on there. 10 to the 27 and 4 pi distance, 8.4. 8.14 into 10 to the 16 squared, right? So now, because this is a radiant flux intensity, just power per unit area, it has watts per meter squared. And breaking this out, this turns out to be 1.18 into 10 to the negative seven watts per meter squared. Determine the radius of the star. Whenever you are asked to determine the radius, you will need to use the Stefan Boltzmann law. So L equals to four pi sigma r squared T four. So L is 9.86 into 10 to the 27, four pi sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, right? Which is 5.67 into 10 to the negative eight. Radius is what I need to find, and this is 9830, the temperature raised to the power four. So from this, I just make the radius the subject. So this is 1.22 into 10 to the nine meters. I see we have questions. Yes. Explain how the surface temperature of a distant star may be determined from the wavelength spectrum of the light from the star. So from the wavelength, how can you find the surface temperature, right? This is now what we need to think about. So if we have the wavelength, so we can use this relationship to find out its speed as well, right? And also if we know the wavelength spectrum, all right, so this is the wavelength spectrum, yes. So if I have the wavelength spectrum, then I know of this relationship as well, right? So the max intensity wavelength, using that and using inverse proportions, I can find the temperature, right? So I'll say that the wavelength of max intensity, intensity, can be used in Wien's law. In Wien's law. But again, with uh, this inverse proportion, you know that I would obviously need to first find out the value of this constant, this k here, right? So for this constant, I would first need to, so for this constant, I would first need to know the max intensity, and I would also need to know the temperature so that I can first find this K out. So I'll say that use a object of known temperature to find max intensity wavelength and then and then use the inverse proportions all right Next part, carbon-15 is an isotope of carbon that undergoes radioactive decay to nitrogen-15, which is a stable isotope. Radioactive decay is both a random and a spontaneous process. State what is meant by random, so not possible to predict when a certain nucleus will decay.
and spontaneous you know is is being unaffected by external factors again this one is uh, also something which is on the platform i'm pretty confident at the end of the nuclear physics chapter right at the end of the lectures i have done this question there a small sample of carbon 15 decays mass m of carbon 15 in the sample decreases with time obviously that's what decay means 10.1 shows the variation with t of the value of ln m and this mass is in 10 to the negative 16 grams and the time is in seconds state how 10.1 demonstrates that radioactive decay is random so we know this is because of the jagged line right so at any point we would expect maybe some decay to take place, but it could be more, or it could be slightly less based on the idea that radioactive decay is random, right? So it, it, this is a jagged line, which is fluctuating. Draw the straight line of best fit. So the straight line is probably going to start from here. Right, so something like this probably. Show that the decay constant of carbon-15 is given by the magnitude of the gradient of your line and B2. So we don't need to calculate this first, we just need to show this. So you have an LN graph, right? So we know that if you're talking about the mass of carbon that also follows exponential decay. So I know that the mass of carbon M, this is m equals to m naught e to the negative lambda t right so i have a graph of ln so ln m equals ln m naught plus ln of e to the negative lambda t which is just which is just negative lambda t right so you can see this is what i have on my y this is what my y intercept would be t is what i have on my x so negative lambda is the gradient here right use your line in v2 to determine lambda give a unit with your answer so again let's see here so this starts off from this point which is what mm. So this would be what 5.1, 5.2, right? So this is negative 4.8. So zero and negative 4.8 is one point. So zero and negative 4.8. Now for another point. So this point, what's this? Uh, so this is at, let's see. So this is here. So this is 11, so 11.2. This must be what, 11.6. So at 11.6, this is negative eight. Right, so now I just use change in y over change in x. So let's just see here what this change in y is. So 4.8 minus eight, this is what? So 3.2 divided by 11.6. Again, you should always show all your working and just trying to get done with this now. So gradient change in y over change in x. So 3.2 over 11.6 and obviously that was a downward sloping line so i'll be expecting a negative gradient so this is 0.276 which i also know is equal to negative lambda so the decay constant here is 0.276 also remember that because of this equation uh, lambda t half 
is ln 2. So I know that this has units of 1 over time. So since time was there in seconds, the time, the unit here is going to be 1 over seconds. Right? So this is what we get here. Use your answers in B4 to calculate half-life. So we just use exactly this. This T half is ln 2 over lambda. So this thing ln 2 divided by this is 2.51, so 2.5 seconds. Next, equation of decay of carbon-15 can be written like this. State and explain how the mass of the products of the decay must compare with the mass of the carbon-15 nucleus, right? So you know that for the reaction to happen spontaneously, energy must be released. And now you need to link this release of energy to the mass defect con concept. So energy must be released. Which is why now you say, so there must be a mass defect. Right, there must be a loss in mass. So mass of products must be less. Mass of products is less than the mass of reactants. All right. So this is this entire paper, uh, which was A2, winter 22, paper 41. All right, now just let me know again what you guys want me to work on. So I, I guess we agreed that next session should be P5 rather than P4 because you have recordings for P4 anyway, right? Is, there, is this what all of us agree on? Because you have recordings. And other than that, so P5 will take place in the same times as the P4 session, just that it's going to be P5 now, it's the same time. Same time, all right. Yeah. Seven o'clock Pakistan time. So with P5s also, uh, what generally troubles you more? You guys more is it question one or question two? What's more difficult? Hmm. Okay. So I guess you also have like some P five recordings on the platform, no? Yes, because I do remember I did P fives last year as well. Do you guys do you guys have access to those? Because I'm thinking that for P fives as well, uh, we do like a general thing because, in my opinion. The general trend in P5 has not changed over the years. There's no like set pattern to it. It's always the same sort of a paper, right? So it's always the same. If you just know once how to do it, uh, then you'll understand. And also again, P5, I'll also be doing something for practicals in general because it's also part of ES. I'm just going to sit down now and think about it. So line of best fit, improvement, stuff like that. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, right? That would be better for question one, especially, yes. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. So just also uh, let us know on the platform if you want to see something else, something different, so we can work on that, right? So next session is then going to be P5. So it's going to be a general session. And because you have recordings for P4s and you, all right? But uh, homework, I think you guys know 
what the homework is going to be. It's going to be winter 22, paper 42, right? We did winter, winter 22, paper 41 right now. Paper 42 is homework, right? If you have like three years worth of solid practice, it's a lot. Because all of us, have, at least my students, and the ones that taught how this goes is they also do like a lot of topical practice. So three years worth of yearly questions, of yearly papers, properly timing yourself and everything, that's more than enough. All right, uh, so see you guys then on Saturday then, inshallah. Lafis.